My name is Hannah and this is my no buy year. I guess I didn't realize that July was ending. <laughs> so I uploaded something else on Sunday and I'm having to upload the July check-in today on August 1st. July was a very busy month in my life and because of that it kind of made it feel like it was an uneventful month in my no-buy, if that makes sense. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the more active I am, the more exuberant and engaged I am in my everyday life, the less I even manage to notice that I'm not shopping anymore. I think that last month's check-in might have been the first check-in in which I was able to say that I truly don't miss shopping. I barely even notice its absence anymore. It took a good six months to get there, but this was my seventh month and that trend has continued. I've had to work to reflect on the way my life used to be. So one of the things I've been thinking about as I've cast my mind back to my old attitudes and my old life, it sounds weird to say that, I mean it was just last year, but one of the things specifically that I've been thinking about is the way that I used to always be looking for something to buy. So even when I wasn't on a shopping trip, and the classic example of this would be my walking down the street in Los Angeles, which I do almost every day because I walk to work most days. Last year, every time I was on the street, I was looking for something to buy. It was either the sunglasses from the street vendors or I would be checking out all of the clothes from the street vendors. There are some boutiques that have sprung up in the part of downtown where I work. I would always be looking in the windows, looking at the prices, wondering if there's anything in there that I could afford or anything that I would want. And this is actually a separate issue from all of the times that I actually would spend actually shopping. So yes, from time to time I would go into one of the boutiques and I would look at all of the clothes and I would maybe buy something or think about buying something. Those are behaviors that I'm no longer engaging in either. But that's not really what I'm talking about. That's not the thing that I've been thinking about this month. The thing that I've been thinking about is that act of always wanting to shop. It was like I had antennae up all the time searching for shopping, like I was always looking for shopping. And the thing that I was looking for was something that I would want to buy. It was like I was wanting to want. I was looking for something to want so that I could mull over it and mull over it and eventually maybe talk myself in to buying it so that I could get that momentary pleasure that comes from buying something new. Or if I were to talk myself out of buying it, I would still have spent hours and hours mulling over it and turning over it. And that mulling, that thinking, was a kind of distraction, a kind of obsession that I craved. So I would always be looking, looking, looking for something to either buy or not buy. But either way, I was always looking for things to think about for material things to think about buying. And it took up so much of my brain. And you know, the antennae are kind of a good metaphor, but I actually don't think that the antennae are down now. It's not like I don't have them. Those antennae are part of me. That's how I am. I'm a writer, I'm an artist, I'm a lover of beauty, I'm an observer, I'm a dancer. I'm always looking. And probably many of us who love beauty are like this. We love beauty because we love beauty. <laughs> and of course what I mean when I say that is that we love beauty. I'm gesturing to all of my makeup and skincare in front of me. We love this stuff because we love beauty. We love color and shape and glamour. We love impact. We love texture. We probably are also the ones who love paintings and museums and amazing music videos. We have passion for art. And I don't think there's anything wrong with channeling that passion into a love of beauty. Meaning makeup, self-care, beautiful tools that we can use on our own bodies and faces and on other people's bodies and faces. I think that that's wonderful. But it's one thing to make a hobby out of beauty and it's another thing to make a hobby out of shopping. And I think that up until this year, up until I started my no-buy, I had conflated the two. 
I was looking for something all the time. I thought I needed more beautiful things all the time in order to satisfy my craving for art, for objects, in order to connect to the world. It's hard to explain. This is hard to explain, you guys. I think probably a lot of you know what I'm getting at because you've gone through it yourselves or you're going through it yourselves. How can I say this better? I think that in many cases, the addiction to shopping for things like makeup and clothing and even homewares, it has to do with identity. It's like a clinging to the external markers of identity. So I was always looking for the items of clothing that would make me feel the most me and make other people be able to see the version of myself that I most wanted to project. And I was always looking for the makeup that would do that as well, the makeup that would be the best representation of my identity. And by constantly searching for it and always looking for the next best thing, I was constantly trying to find a better representation of my identity. And in that way, it was almost like I was constantly looking for a better identity, for a new shiny version of myself. And this is definitely true of homewares as well. I was always looking for the dishes that were the perfect dishes for me to have. The exact cutting boards that I wanted to feel like I should have in my best life as my best self. I'm not condemning this behavior. It's messy. It's a lot of wonderful impulses and beautiful qualities and a, and a kind of love, like a depth of love for the beautiful things in the world that drive this behavior. But when the result is a life that is 100% steeped in shopping, a brain that is absolutely addled with the constant searching for something to want, then those theoretically wonderful qualities have become kind of twisted. And actually, I don't perceive it as an accident or, or as having been my fault or your fault if you found yourself in a similar place. I think that those qualities are actively twisted and actively taken advantage of by corporations who want our money. I guess what I'm trying to say is that as someone who's more prone than certain other people to depending on things like clothes and makeup and homewares and the art with which I surround myself to define me, as that kind of person, I am particularly susceptible to advertising campaigns and beautiful packaging and incredible imagery with stunning models, photo shoots where things are impeccably styled, magazine spreads featuring dream houses and beautiful quirky homes. Those things really push my buttons, they, they light me up, and they make me convinced that the pursuit of those objects will satisfy my need for a perfected sense of self. I still feel like that's a weak way to describe it. Um, maybe the term fantasy self that I've used before is useful here, but I think you know what I'm talking about and I want to move on to the next phase of this idea because I have happy news about this. So I've been thinking about the fact that the addiction to shopping is about identity, that it's a kind of searching, a kind of desperation, a kind of constant redefining of the self. And wherever that comes from, and it might be different for you than, than it is for me, but I do feel like it was, ah, gosh, it's kind of grim to say that it was an emptiness because I didn't experience it as an emptiness. I did experience it as a love of life, as a kind of passion. But that passion was so specific and so inward turned. That passion for the world, I feel like it has the potential to be external, to be giving, to be generous, but instead it was really turned inward on myself all the time. So my love of beautiful things was always about how I could attach those beautiful things to my identity, make them of me, and make them mine and therefore make myself of them. We see all that there is to have and be. We see how incredibly beautiful a coffee table can be or the texture of a stunning sweater. 
And the fact that we are able to love it so much and to see it so clearly, to see its beauty so fully, makes us feel dissatisfied that we can't have it for ourselves, that we can't make it part of our own lives, that we can't have other people see us having it, being it. So in my attachment to shopping all of those years, I was coming from this dissatisfied place that grew out of attentiveness to the world, attention to detail and attention to beauty, but nonetheless, it was a troubled place. It was a place of jealousy, a place of worrying that I'm not enough the way that I am, a place of perfectionism. And, and here I'm finally coming around to the point of this check-in. You would think that in order to change the behavior, you would have to first address those problems. So basically, if I painted this picture for someone, if I was like, here's this woman, she's in her early 30s, she's unable to save any money because she spends every last dime that she has on stuff that she doesn't need, she has 10 times more makeup than she needs, she's constantly buying new clothes, and it's all coming from this desperate need to redefine identity and to attach beautiful things to identity because she's troubled, because she is a person who has a hard time finding peace inside herself, a hard time finding satisfaction, a hard time being content. I feel like when presented with the description of that person, me, maybe you, the logical reaction is to think that you would have to fix the trouble in order to change the behavior. I would have thought to send myself to therapy first. <laughs> I would have thought to address the issue of dissatisfaction, the core problem, the hole inside, to heal that and then hopefully after that hole is healed the shopping behavior would improve. That seems logical. Somebody has this problem and it's causing them to behave this way. So what you do is you fix this problem and then this behavior also gets fixed. But that's not what is happening. Changing the troubling behavior is turning out to have a massive effect on the root causes of the behavior. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know if this is a thing that we already know about <laughs> that happens. There's probably been studies on this. This is probably an example of an existing theory or an existing way of understanding human behavior. But I didn't know about it before. I don't know how to talk about it in a more academic way or a more scientific way. All I can say is that I know what it is in me that was driving me to have an unhealthy relationship with shopping. And my no buy is healing that thing. I do have a problem. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, okay. I have historically been a person who can know in my mind that I really do have everything that I need and still feel restless in my heart, still feel dissatisfied. I never thought that buying new stuff would bring me peace or that shopping was my peaceful space. I never mistook it for true satisfaction, true contentment, but I was using the momentary pleasures of shopping to distract me from the fact that I wasn't content. So how can I explain the way in which a deeper satisfaction or a deeper contentment is starting to show itself in my life? Some of the ways are directly related to shopping. So for example, I was driving home from the desert. I spent a couple days in the desert with a good friend this weekend. And on my drive back, I passed a huge shopping center that I used to go to. It's about 20 minutes away from where I live in LA. And there's a Nordstrom Rack there. And I used to love going to Nordstrom Rack. Going to Nordstrom Rack was the definition of pumping temporary pleasure into my veins so that I wouldn't feel dissatisfied with my life. And I 
could never spend less than several hours in there. I would tell myself I was just gonna spend half an hour and I would go into Nordstrom Rack and I would be in there for like four hours, taking cart after cart full of things to the dressing room, trying them all on. And whenever I would see a Nordstrom Rack, whenever I would drive past this one, for example, those antenna would go to it. I would want to go in, I would see it and, and it appeared to me like this luscious land of opportunity and I would start scheming. When was the next time I could get myself into Nordstrom Rack? When was the next time I could fritter away an entire afternoon searching, searching, searching inside that gigantic store? This weekend, when I drove past the Nordstrom Rack on my way home, I saw the sign and there was a superficial part of me that reacted in the same way I always have. The surface part of me went, ooh, Nordstrom Rack, we love that. Someday I'll get to go back there. But then I thought about the reality of that. I envisioned myself going in there and getting sucked in and searching and searching and searching. And it made me feel so unhappy and disappointed and sort of desperate and frantic on the behalf of all of the other things in my life that I want to be doing, which is a really new feeling for me because as much as I love all of my projects and as much as I feel like I have a lot of life's work to get done, I've always been happy to take a break from all of that and spend the day at the mall and just get totally sucked into searching for new objects to attach to my identity. <laughs> I've always had that craving. It's always been so powerful that I was allowing myself to lose hours and hours and hours, days and days and days of my precious life in the service of that obsession. The idea of spending half a day in Nordstrom Rack or all day at the mall is kind of horrifying to me now. It's horrible. I have so much to do. And I just can't imagine how I used to fit all of that shopping into my life. It simultaneously makes me feel sad about how much time I did spend. And it also makes me feel happier about my life. It makes me love the things I love more. And this is what I've been talking about. I'm finally getting around to the issue of contentment. The fact that I want to protect what I have what I'm doing, my writing, my reading, my YouTube channel, interacting with you guys in the comments, my time with my boyfriend, my time cooking, my time just hanging out in our little apartment, our little imperfect space. The fact that I want to protect all of that from this dragon that used to have me, to me that means that I value what I have more now than I used to value it. I don't need more. And I really do mean this in the meta sense. Yeah, I don't need more makeup, I don't need more clothes, but I wasn't just looking for makeup and clothes. I was looking for another self or a new avenue of self. By cutting myself off from the constant search for new makeup and new clothes and new identity, I have asked myself to dwell protractedly month after month in the identity that I already have and in the life that I already have. And the more time I spend here, <laughs> the more grateful I am for it. It's not perfect. My life isn't perfect. There are all sorts of things that I'm always trying to improve upon, but now I'm trying to improve upon them in the deep ways, in real ways, rather than just by adding a new lipstick on top <laughs> of my face and thinking that that will make me a better and a happier person. So I'm finding myself doing things like getting rid of all of the stuff that I don't love, doing a much better job of keeping my spaces clean. That's always kind of been a struggle for me. I'm starting to feel like I can see what I want more clearly and that it's easier for me to talk about what I want and to make space for what other people want. I just feel like my head is more clear. And that clear-headedness 
is a kind of happiness that I have always had a hard time finding. So I've been thinking all of these thoughts all of this month, and when I was out in the desert at the hot springs with my dear friend this weekend, I was talking with her about some of these things, and she told me about a book that she's read recently that is shockingly relevant to the experience that I've been having. I just checked it out of the library and I just started reading it today, so I can't give a full book report yet, but I'm definitely going to. This is the book, it's called The Hacking of the American Mind and it's by Robert Lustig. Robert Lustig is a pediatrician and if you think you've heard his name before, it's because he did become quite well known for the work he's done on the effects of sugar on the human body. So there's actually a YouTube video of Dr. Lustig talking about sugar, and he's basically reporting on his findings as a doctor when it comes to the way in which sugar is making Americans so much fatter and so much sicker than we were even just 30 years ago. So that video has millions and millions of views, I believe, and if you're interested in sugar, or you're interested in that kind of science, I highly recommend it. I've had quite the battle with sugar in my life and there are a lot of parallels between my experience with sugar and my experience with shopping. And I would actually say that what I've learned from battling sugar even helped inform the project of the No Buy Year from the very beginning. So when I sat down to make the rules, when I framed the project for myself and tried to set myself up for success, there were things that I knew about myself that helped me to shape the project that I knew because I had been working for so long to extract myself from the clutches of sugar addiction. So anyway, I was already into Robert Lustig because of his work on sugar, but this book is specifically about happiness. It's about the types of happiness. And from what I can tell, just from having read the introduction, one of the basic premises of the book has to do with the difference between pleasure and satisfaction. And obviously I haven't gotten very far into it yet, but I believe that part of the book is going to be a discussion of how companies that are trying to sell us stuff have done active work to trick us into conflating those two values. So we've been tricked into believing that pleasure and happiness are the same thing. And pleasure only lasts for a little while. So if you keep seeking pleasure and seeking pleasure and seeking pleasure, thinking that that is what's going to make you happy, then you'll keep like pushing that button over and over and over again because it doesn't last. And when pushing that button is buying something, which it is for so many of us, buying food that we're addicted to, buying makeup, if on some fundamental level our brains have been changed to believe that buying a new lipstick is the way to happiness, when really all it is is the way to pleasure, but pleasure only lasts for a couple of hours, we keep pushing that button, we keep buying the lipstick, buying the lipstick, and what happens is that we never get happy because it's just pleasure that we're seeking, but we do get broke <laughs> and the companies get rich. Anyway, I don't want to try to explain the book before I've read it because that would be foolish. I am about to read it and I will come back and talk more about the book after I've read it. But the thing I wanted to share in this video is that I was simply electrified by the concept of pleasure versus happiness because what I have experienced over the last seven months is that because I took away my ability to keep pushing that button. And for a while, for the first several months, I felt kind of messed up and confused because I didn't have access to the repeated activity that I was accustomed to doing in the name of trying to achieve a good feeling. But over time, as I have continued to not do that thing and not do that thing, I've started to notice this other thing it's a quieter thing. It's much more of a slow roll. It's a much calmer and less flashy kind of joy. But unlike the pleasure that I was constantly generating before that would then evaporate within just a couple of hours or a couple of days, this new thing, this happiness, 
is always there. And for those of you who have read about brain chemistry or who are interested in this, you may already know this, but the pleasure chemical in the brain is dopamine. And the happiness chemical is serotonin. It's exciting to have been thinking about all of these things over the past month and really kind of noticing a shift in my life, a further shift, but I felt like I was trying to invent the language with which to talk about it. And then right at the end of the month, I came across this book and from what I can tell, this book is going to give me the language with which to talk about it, and even more than that, the brain science with which to better understand what I'm going through. So that's exciting. That is basically it, but before I go, I have two little things that I want to tell you about. One is that I really want to start posting more on Instagram. I like Instagram a lot, and I go through phases of doing pretty well at posting every couple of days, but I've completely fallen off the wagon really for months at this point. So if you aren't already following me on Instagram, I'm going to leave a link in the down bar and click over there and follow me and hopefully I will follow through with my promise to post more. And the second thing I want to tell you about is this really, really cool project. My friend Kristen is a writer and an absolute powerhouse of a woman and she has had a long-standing dream, a dream that she has talked to me about ever since I've known her. The dream was to create a space for women who are writers to work outside of their home. It costs a lot to rent a separate office and most writers can't afford that. So she had the idea to build this group space, like a community of writers and make it accessible and make it affordable and also make it a place where women can help each other along and support each other in their careers and support each other in their art. She started telling me about this idea three, two or three years ago, I think, maybe three years ago, and now she's actually doing it. She's actually done it. She has established this space and she's doing it in Detroit, which is really cool. I'm going to link it down below. It's called The Room Project. If you are in Detroit and you are a woman writer or a non-binary writer, then you absolutely need to know about this thing. But I also wanted to share it with you guys because they're currently doing a fundraiser. If you skipped buying a lipstick for stupid National Lipstick Day, then maybe consider taking however much you would have spent on that lipstick and sending it along to The Room Project because it is an unbelievably good cause. It's something that I believe so strongly in. So I'm going to leave the link to the Indiegogo page down below. If you're even remotely interested in things like this, please click through and read about it because it's truly spectacular and very heartening. Even if you can't donate at all, it's really amazing to witness something like this being started and becoming successful and I just think it's it's like a joyful thing to know about. It's like the real deal. Like this is the stuff that dreams are made of. And I know that they'll be making really, really good use of any little dollar that you might be able to give. Anyway, that really is it. I know this was a bit of a rambly one, but I really appreciate you being here with me and watching me and liking my videos and commenting on my videos and it's just been really extraordinary to see this little community grow and I appreciate you all so much. You don't even know. Thank you for watching and don't forget to take extra good care of yourself this week so that you can be the most effective version of yourself as you do your work in the world. Bye.